Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. For those of you who are new to our broadcast, this is Daring Dialogues. And I am your host, Shantae Charles. Today is Finance and Wealth Building Friday. And we are continuing our read into Poweronomics, the National Plan to Empower Black America from Dr. Claude Anderson, as well as Tools of Titans from Tim Ferriss. And so we're not just looking at the historical perspective on wealth in this country, but we're also looking at present day um, entrepreneurs, titans, if you will, billionaires, millionaires of successful companies or successful brands um, to be able to give us some insight into some practical things that we can do to uh, better ourselves in the world of entrepreneurship. So I hope that you are ready to learn. Um, in terms of Black Economic Wealth and Power, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson has started us off by talking about three impediments to success. And the first impediment that we've been looking at in detail through his writings is the maldistribution of wealth. And he said part of that maldistribution of wealth comes from our monopolized society. And so what we have been reading about is his detailing um, a brief history of monopoly building in America. And so we've been trying to understand and work through what are the monopolies that this country has established so we can better know what we're working with and um, we can know how to navigate around it. A lot of times people say, well, you know, we don't necessarily want to hear the history of money and we don't want to hear the backdrop and that kind of thing. <clears throat> But it's hard to understand how to play the game if you don't know the rules, right? If you don't know the setup, if you don't know how these things came to be the way they are so that you can work around these systems. So we started out by talking about racial monopolies and then we moved into population monopolies and then we moved into wealth monopolies and now today we're going to cover media and political and judicial monopolies and end it with the implication of monopolies. Next Friday, we're going to talk about the second impediment, which is in what he calls inappropriate behavior patterns of black America. And I can't wait to dig into that because I have a lot to say <laughs> about black America and our inappropriate behavior patterns if we want to build wealth. So let's first dip into what he says here about media monopolies. Commercial media creates a virtual reality of our society. Not only are the owners of media responsible for the information that we see and hear, but they create images of blacks and define us in our sense of community. Well, right off the bat, we know that this is problematic. Um, if you have ever been out of the country and gone to another country, you know that this is problematic because the way that the world views us is a lot of times based on the media that is coming out of the United States and being projected onto the world stage. And oftentimes the media that other countries get concerning black people is negative. <laughs> and so if you're getting 99.9% percent negative portrayals of black Americans to other out to other countries and 0.1 percent positive then guess what when I go out to another country as a black American it's going to make it harder for me to do business in other countries and I know some people don't understand that or get that but it does so that is the first problem this is troublesome for blacks because whites hold ownership monopolies over this nation's print and electronic media. This is something else that people are not aware of. 
most of media is controlled by white companies and corporations. Media ownership is a source of control over power, wealth, and information. Media power is political power. Well, how do we know that? We saw that play out in these 2016 elections. Even uh, Mr. Trump, you know, um, even he gave credit to the media for helping to give him all of this free advertisement and free press that got him elected. And now, <clears throat> I almost feel like he's angry that the media gave him so much attention and got him elected that now he is calling the media the enemy of the people. Where, it, well, it, in, in a sliver of a sense, he is correct. Because probably had the media not given him so much attention and not given so much credence to most of the lies that he was telling, we wouldn't have had so many people who rely on media to give them the truth. We wouldn't have had so many people that went out and voted for him. So in that framework, he is actually correct. The media put him on a, put him on a platform, gave him a stage, didn't give the other candidates as much press. And so, of course, he looked like the candidate who seemed to be the most solid. Right. Because, again, they went over and over again about how much Trump was not spending campaign money on media advertisement because the media was giving him space and time. All right. So media power is political power. Whites control nearly 100 percent of this nation's 1500 daily newspapers. And I'm sure there are more because this book is a little old. 11,000 radio stations, 11,800 cable systems, 1,500 television stations, and the major internet businesses. These monopolies ensure that blacks won't have an effective mass communication system of their own. It means that blacks will always have to ask permission to use white-owned mass communication vehicles to reach out to other blacks or discuss sensitive racial issues. This is problematic. And we'll talk about it later. Why? Members of the public who desire to be exposed to the perspective of blacks are deprived of that information and do not have access to that type of unfiltered. The key word there is unfiltered programming. Unfiltered programming. Now, because this book was, was written in the late 90s, obviously it's not taking into account um, YouTube or Zoom or Periscope, right? Because these are all now new tools of media. So, um, but again, who owns these media tools becomes the question. And the moment you say something within this media framework that the owners don't like, even if it's true, you can be banned or you can be blocked or you can be locked out of the space of communicating with people who look like yourself. Okay? So that is the issue here. White society constructs monopolies inside of monopolies. For example, Clear Channel Communications provides a good example of media ownership as an important racial monopoly that is also a major source of wealth and power. According to the company's 1999 annual report, it owned 900 radio stations, 19 television stations, and 700,000 outdoor advertising units in the United States. It has equity interest in 240 radio stations internationally. The company's gross revenue at the time was $3 billion, which was up 97%. White media protects white interests. Without wealth to own media outlets, blacks will always be in the position of complaining about the images others present of them, which is why uh, one, of the, one of the things that people have been pushing for is to establish your own media outlets, your own media networks, your own social media sites besides Facebook. Everybody knows, a lot of people at this point know, that Facebook tends to ban things that they feel is quote-unquote a violation, right? 
but I can read out loud. I got actually banned on Facebook Live. I can no longer live stream through Facebook. And what was I doing? I was reading aloud Martin Luther King's books. That's what I was doing. All of a sudden, I can no longer live stream through Facebook. So, yes, they're choosing what kind of information they want out to the public. However, I'm banned from Facebook live stream, but Facebook keeps up videos of black people being shot down in their cars. Do you see how that is? Yes, Facebook keeps up videos of black people fighting. Facebook uh, keeps up uh, videos of black parents beating their children. So the imagery that people are getting through the media is skewed. Okay? So that's the point that I'm making. And because they have control over the media, they can decide what kinds of regular images people are seeing about black people. Because there's nothing wrong with reading aloud Martin Luther King, but yet I'm now banned from using Facebook Live. Right? So they're now filtering what kinds of information goes out, and therefore it, it skews the perception that people have. Um, Facebook allows for nudity videos to be up, pornography. I've seen all kinds of stuff, racial um, hatred videos. And when you report these videos, Facebook will come back and say it doesn't violate the community standards. So cursing, pornography, um, shooting people dead videos don't violate your community standards, but reading Martin Luther King's books aloud does. Think about that. And I know that from personal experience and not something I'm making up. <laughs> so the, the, the point is that we have to begin to have more outlets to present our side of the story, right? As one person said, you know, as, as long as the victor is, is telling the story, the other side doesn't really get their side heard. The one who wins is usually the one who's telling the story. So he says here in 1999, the NAACP led a complaint and threatened a boycott against all the networks for a television season that lacked minority characters in the program lineup. Now, let's even talk about that. Some of us are simply satisfied with seeing minority characters in a television show that we're not going further and saying, let's see some black producers. Let's see, you know, people behind the scenes running things, not just acting in shows. Because again, acting in shows, if you look at the, if you look at the shows that are out there, it still limits what kind of person you're going to portray. A lot of people are like, oh, we're so excited. We've got all these black lead actors in um, film or we've got these black lead actors in television. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't watch it. I don't watch a lot of it because of the programming. It's still negative. So don't expect me to be happy because you have a black person leading a negative imagery in a television show. That's still not acceptable. But for some people, it is. They, don't, they still don't get the point that it's not just about putting us in place. It's about putting us in place and showing us in positive lights. <laughs> not just something that's going to satisfy us and say, oh, we put you in. We put you in. But what did you put us in doing? Did you, did you showcase an intelligent black woman who wasn't crazy? Did you showcase an intelligent black woman um, who wasn't in an adulterous relationship? Did you showcase an intelligent black woman who hadn't been to prison, right? Or are those the only images or imagery you have in mind when you think about intelligent black women? Why does it have to be some psychopathic um, issue going on with her along with her intelligence? Why can't she just be intelligent? Why you can't why can't you display her intelligence as a virtue and not as 
something she's using to cope with the rest of the dysfunction in her life. So we have to look at what kinds of images are being presented. Okay. All right. Now it's very interesting about what he's going to say next because I actually had a dream about this. I had a dream that a group of black attorneys got together and sued the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. And in my dream, they won the case. It was a major like class action suit against the imagery that was being allowed to put out to be put out about black Americans that was affecting how black Americans were being treated in society. And they actually won the case in my dream. And it was a humongous amount of monies that they won that the FCC agreed to put in a trust fund for black America. And it was like, it was like shifting, like a ground shifting uh, kind of settlement that allowed black Americans who had been um, kind of on the lower class uh, economic rung were able to move up because of this trust fund. Now, I hope that happens. I think it would be awesome. Um, but that was my dream. He says, in the program, the minority characters in the program lineup, the network owners did not forget that blacks existed. They chose not to include them. In matters like this, Blacks negotiate from a position of weakness because they own no web networks and few television stations. Kind of like what happened with um, Oscar So White, right? 2016, people got angry because they didn't nominate very few or if any um, black actors to the Oscars. Well, they heard, they heard the dissension. They heard blacks being angry about it. Um, they couldn't have miss, you know, they, they, they looked at the numbers probably because I think blacks spend about 40, about 42% of ticket sales come from black Americans. So if we boycott theaters and don't go see any movies, that's money lost. So this year, what did you see? Yes, you saw better movie choices, but you also saw them step up to the plate, Right and began to nominate black actors for the awards and the films. So we don't want to be the people who continue to negotiate or try to negotiate from a position of weakness. We have to get to the point to where we're owning our own stuff. Now, of course, when he wrote this, um, I don't believe TV One was started yet, but TV One is a good example, but it's the only example right now. TV One, and the Oprah Winfrey Network. We've got a long way to go still. And if you look at the programming on the Oprah Winfrey Network, some of that I would not watch. Because again, the imagery and the stereotyping is still yet there. All right? In the case of the complaint, the NAACP would have come closer to addressing a core black problem. If it had challenged the FCC, there you go, and the executive branch of government to demand greater black ownership of television outlets, without ownership, blacks are unable to communicate with their own people, and this is key, without passing through and having the approval of non-black media owners. And since black issues tend to make whites feel guilty or threatened, white media only gives blacks access to their media when the issues are race neutral or relevant to the major society. So if you're coming on with a lot of stuff talking about empowering black people, chances are you're going to have a hard time getting in the door to do a television show or getting in the door with a network because they don't want to rock the boat. All right. So this is why we need our own media outlet so we can say what we need to say, when we need to say it, how we need to say it. <laughs> okay. And the other issue is if it's not relevant, quote unquote, to them, to the majority society, notice I didn't say the majority people in the world, but the majority society, then they still will have a problem with letting you in the door. 
Even when Blacks own media, they have impediments to programming and economic success. The few broadcast and print properties that are Black-owned are so dependent upon white advertisers for revenue that programming from a Black perspective is often muted to avoid disapproval as being too Black. Anything that is all Black is too Black. There are not enough black advertisers to support black media companies, which are an afterthought with white advertisers. If they do elect to purchase advertising from black owned media outlets. Exactly. I do, I do agree with that. It will be safe programming. So PBS, right? Is safe programming. It's mainly because it's talking about history, it's kind of talking about what's already happened, but it's it's fairly safe programming. They don't PBS doesn't come out and say, "Shame on you, uh, white people, for letting this go on for several several centuries and never doing anything about it." What are you going to do about it now? No, PBS presents the facts, lets you lets you kind of mull through the facts and moves on, right? They avoid supporting black media when it reflects racial controversy. Again, they avoid supporting black media when it reflects racial controversy. Um, Ava DuVernay, right? She released the 13th on Netflix. Had she tried to release it on a major television channel, do you think that they would have said, you know, I need you to take out this. I need you to take out this. I need you to... Uh, reword this. I don't want you to interview this person. There would have been lots of restrictions on what she put out. So she put it out onto an independent platform so that she could reach more people with her viewpoint. All right. No other group actually has such social prohibitions. Nearly 99% of all white Americans live in all white communities, work in all white offices, conduct business with white customers, and send their children to all white schools. White print and broadcast media outlets target nearly 100% white audiences, but they are not criticized for being too white. Even national political parties spend less with black media than they spend to reach other groups. According to uh, this report in the Challenger magazine in the 2000 issue, the Republican National Committee at this time indicated it would spend $10 million in advertising to Hispanic media and $0 to black media. Now let's back up a, for a moment. Um, I do remember Obama during his tenure, he did put something in place um, concerning black communications uh, companies. I can't remember all that it entailed, but it had something to do with allowing black people to invest in black media companies. And I think it was specifically for um, black Americans. And it was kind of set up so that black Americans could kind of get in first with investments. But think about this. During this time, the Republicans said black people aren't even worth advertising to. In other words, we feel that the Democrats at that time would get so much of the vote that they were a that black people on on in general were such a shoe in for the Democratic Party that they had allocated zero dollars with black media to advertise with black people. They basically said you aren't even worth advertising to. But yet, when they when they don't have an increase in people coming over to their party, and they're surely not going to have now. Lots of black Republicans are leaving the party. Now, at this point, when they don't have black Republicans coming over, then they complain. Dude, you said you were going to invest zero dollars into black media to advertise to black people. So that tells me, you don't even think we're worth your time or your money, right? White media monopolies go unchallenged regardless of how frequently and unjustly black people are treated. The control of images we see by media and the corporations who buy advertising was demonstrated in Detroit, Michigan at the premiere showing of the Tulsa race riots. 
And if you're just coming in, we're reading from Powernomics, and we're talking about the media monopoly. The movie produced for HBO told the story of the 1921 racial assault that claimed the lives of approximately 600 black people. Their homes and their businesses were robbed and bombed by the government and burned by whites, who admitted in the program that they were jealous of black people's economic successes. So a lot of times people say, well, if black people would only, you know, do for themselves, if they would only, you know, pick themselves up by the bootstraps that they don't have, then they could see some progress. Well, black people were doing that. There were plenty of black owned businesses before the 60s. Else, black people would have not had any place to eat, <laughs> any place to sleep, any place to go to the movie theater, any place to catch a bus. There were black-owned companies before the 1960s, okay? And so what happened, in many cases, like the people admitted in this film, they began to grow jealous and envious of black economic success. So on one hand, you have them saying, we don't want to help black people. Black people need to help themselves. And then on the other hand, when black people did help themselves, jealousy ensued and people said, I'm going to burn it all down. Okay. And that is what happened in the 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma race riots that they call race riots, but it was actually genocidal um, destruction of a black community. 600 black people were killed. They hadn't done anything wrong except be successful. All right? So sometimes America tries to rewrite our history, but that's why I'm here. Okay? So, although this film is a poignant and important historical documentary, white businesses in the Detroit area refused to financially support its airing at the, at the Wayne State University campus. Government resources had been used to develop and maintain majority monopolies. Government policies allow media and communication monopolies, such as telephone and broadcast industries. The internet was developed largely with government funds, but it's now owned by private companies and is becoming another white-owned media monopoly. And in case you didn't know, if you do a little bit of research, Facebook, the owner of Facebook, the owners of YouTube and the owners of Google are all friends or they're either, they're either friends or they're related. So that's a monopoly. Okay. <laughs> so even though we see those three things and we think, oh, they're independent from each other. Really, they're not. They're still a type of monopoly. So that was our section on media monopoly. Let's take a look at political and judicial monopolies. The nation's political and judicial systems are racial monopolies that form the superstructure of society. These monopolies make nearly every political and legal issue about race a foregone conclusion. Politics and the court system tend to be more anti-black than the larger society. Legal justice has come to mean ensuring that blacks don't break the law while forcing them to submit to whites who break the law. Though their population monopolies ensure that whites dominate and rule, racism within the political and legal systems guarantee blacks will rarely win. Thurgood Marshall, by his acts and omissions, was probably the only U.S. Supreme Court justice prejudiced in favor of black people. However, outnumbered eight to one, his legal opinions on the bench had little real impact on race rulings. Now, if we did not understand before the importance of an attorney general that is for all people, and if we did not understand before the importance of Supreme Court justices that are for all people, we are seeing the fallout of it now, right? The uh, recently appointed AG, which I hope that he resigns. <laughs> um, with all the scandal that has come out in the last 48 hours, one would think that he would not only recuse himself from certain cases, but that he would simply resign, right? But he had a history of prejudicial rulings 
concerning civil rights. People tried to warn people about this man before they appointed him. They didn't listen. Coretta Scott King wrote a 10 page letter about this man. Coretta Scott King warning people about his racial prejudices and bias and how he intends to, to undo the work of her husband, the late MLK. They looked at it. They read a part of it. I think it was Senator Elizabeth Warren kind of got told to basically sit down and, and, and stop reading the letter right before his hearing. They went ahead and they chose him anyway. And the first thing that this man has done is take a known voters rights case in Texas where it is shown and proven that they were intentionally um, creating laws that went against black people. All in the court documents is shown proof that these people were deliberately writing these laws to make sure black people could not vote in an area. And he decides to withdraw from the case and say, we're not going to challenge what they did. <clears throat> that was his first decision. So again, it does matter who's on the bench. It does matter who's in our Supreme Court. We know that um, during Obama's administration, the Voting Rights Act was gutted. And when I say gutted, it took out the provisions that made states be responsible to the federal government to make sure that they were not deliberately creating racist voting practices that actually was removed. So they no longer have to have a checkpoint with the federal government as to what they're doing, which is why we saw some of the things we saw in this past election. All right. So it does matter who is heading up our political and judicial systems. All right. So let's see what else he says here. Michael Lynn in his book, Up From Conservatism, shares a story that illustrates how bias against blacks is institutionalized within the judicial monopoly. William Rehnquist, the chief justice of the Supreme Court at the time, was ordered away from a polling place in Arizona because he was demanding that black voters be forced to prove they could read by reading the Constitution before being allowed to mark their ballots. People, this is unconstitutional. <laughs> and he was on the Supreme Court. But here he is at a voting booth trying to demand that people read the Constitution and prove that they can read before they go mark their ballots. That's the kind of person we had sitting on the Supreme Court. All right? Rehnquist passed the litmus test, supposedly, of President Reagan, who appointed him along with his racial attitudes, Chief Justice of the highest court in the nation. In this position... His racial bias could inject and infect court decisions throughout the nation. Any counter bias for blacks was nullified with um, Clarence Thomas' appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court. Consequently, judicial monopolies control the fate of blacks in ways that are rarely beneficial. All right. Whites maintain a monopoly on holding political office whether blacks vote or not. This is why one of the things that people are consistently saying is don't just complain about what you see happening in your community. Get yourself into a place where you qualify to run for the seat that you're complaining about. This is why everybody is talking about 2018 because the majority of those seats that are now being held will be up for re-election. So it's 2017 now. What can you be doing in your community? You can either choose to run yourself and start preparing yourself to run. Or you can look out amongst you and choose people to run and financially back them and get a campaign going 
so that they can run for those seats. Because if you don't, <laughs> we're going to see more of what we see right now. We're going to see more of people, of politicians, going against the will of their own constituents that voted them in. You're going to see politicians who are doing what the current ones are doing now. They're refusing to hold town, town hall meetings. They're refusing to go to the town hall meetings to even hear the people that elected them to office. That They should be ashamed, but they're not. And why aren't they ashamed? Because they figure, I've got it in the bag. They figure, hey, you're just going to complain. You're not going to vote me out. You're not going to move and make the steps necessary to remove me from office. Right. They're in already, but 2018, they can be out. <laughs> and they can be out with not just a, a, a somebody we just throw in there, right? They can be out with a viable candidate running against them. And so there is enough time to find viable candidates that can run against these people and get them out. <laughs> I hope y'all are hearing me today. So... <clears throat> a monopoly on the elective and appointment process for public office continues to place white males in control of 99% of all levels of government and legal systems. Like, I don't know if I live right here in what they call the Beltway, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. So I get to see this up close and personal. This is probably the whitest of white congress we've had in a while <laughs> okay and so in other words if we don't get control of the monopoly that's happening if we don't have people in there representing the voice of the minority the marginalized if you don't have voices in there representing you you're going to continue to see the same kinds of bad laws, the same kinds of bad policies, the same kinds of things ignoring the poor and ignoring the marginalized coming out of the White House. All right. Then he says this, whites in position of power and authority have been conditioned by their experiences in American society to protect the status quo and the advantage of their own group's self-interest. And this is unfortunately something that we're seeing, right? We're seeing the self-interest of one group of people in the country be protected while everybody else's rights gets trampled upon. So you have a part of the country that is saying, oh, I love what our president is doing, right? But then you have the other part of our country saying, our president is now trampling on the rights of people. There's total disregard in some cases for human life. There's total disregard for the breakup and the breakdown of families. But on the other hand, those who are being represented by this political structure right now, they're loving it. They're excited about it. They're even talking about four more years. But everybody else who is being affected in a negative way because they don't have proper representation that can speak up for them or that will speak up for them is now saying we have got to do something about this. All right. As we continue on. The majority of whites who do hold positions in the political and judicial systems are descendants of white immigrants themselves who entered this nation centuries after the ancestors of black Americans. Though their ancestors were not in this country, when blacks were enslaved and segregated, special admission status reserved seats of power for them in the judicial and the political systems. This nation's fundamental democratic values of inalienable rights and principles of fair play have yet to fully apply to black America. There is no credible evidence that whites understand the true nature of racism and its monopolies or are concerned about the negative impact of them on the life chances of blacks. Whiteness as a monopoly is a subconscious construct that promotes aversion to any form of blackness. 
Whites tend to equate blackness to liberalism. This is true. Whenever I start speaking about politics for some reason, people seem to think that number one, I'm a liberal, or number two, I voted for Hillary Clinton. And I didn't. And I'm not. But in our society, because so many people do vote Democratic, they, they equate it to what they call liberalism. Now, liberalism isn't all bad. But the way that they see it and the way that they tack that word on, they try to stereotype and put all black people into a same kind of mindset or a same kind of thinking. And so, again, he's talking here now about what happens when you think that everybody in a certain people group is liberal. It has the effect of moving all of the nation's political parties to racial selfishness. Remember, again, we talked about how the Republican National Convention, when they decided to create their budget, they allocated, what, zero dollars to the interests of, of reaching black people. Zero dollars. Because in their mind, blacks were already a shoe-in for the Democratic Party, so they didn't need to waste any time or money trying to reach out to them. They stack the law enforcement and court systems with conservative officers and judges who are predisposed to anti-black feelings. The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which was enacted solely for the equal protection of blacks, is now co-opted and used by the political system to maintain dominance. By the virtue of black people's inherited disadvantages through slavery, peonage, and Jim Crow, and whites' inherited life advantages, there is a lock into conflict and competition. These racial conflicts and the accompanying disparities cannot be eliminated by indifference or by accommodation. When black leaders accommodate and compromise, they lose respect and the black masses move no closer to power or wealth. Moreover, whites find it easier to pacify blacks with symbolic rather than substantial political benefits and opportunities. This only further reinforces racial inequities. Two things. Many people saw that in the case of President Obama. He was more of a, a symbol. He was more of a figurehead of success than actual success and progress for black America. Now that his presidency is over, yes, he did some things. Yes, he moved some policies. But when it came to black America... There was very little policy given to us. There was song, there was dance, there was the, the first family dressing well. But when it came down to substantial policies to move black America forward, we did not get that. Same thing is happening now. For those of you who have been keeping up with the news of close to 100 um, HBCU presidents, right? They met with President Trump. They gave a wonderful photo op, but many of those black presidents of the HBCUs are now speaking out about what actually happened in that meeting. <laughs> Excuse me for raising my voice. <laughs> so if you're going to go into a meeting <clears throat> with a president, with an administration that is blatantly white supremacist in nature, <clears throat> I'm trying to take my time here. <laughs> if you're going to go into a meeting and then you come out of that meeting because the president was supposed to sign an executive order for HBCUs and most of the HBCU presidents went into that meeting expecting him to increase funding for HBCUs. There was no added money to that executive order that he signed. It was words on a paper. There was no promise of additional funding. There was no promise of um, helping or keeping in place things like the PLUS loan and the Pell Grant and those kinds of things. There was a promise, though, that if you Negroes are not properly spending the money you already have, we're going to reallocate it to somewhere else. That was the promise. If you read between the lines, he was saying that we're going to make sure we're going to move HBCU 
um, issues, we're going to move them from the Department of Education and we're going to reshift them to the White House to focus on. And if we find out or we think that you all are not using the funds you already have allocated to HBCUs, yeah, <laughs> we're going to take what you do have. So there was no added money or there was no added promise or there was no added commitment to make sure that HBCUs continue to, to operate. So all that they got out of that meeting was a symbol. Really, Trump actually got the symbol, right? He got a photo op that he can use in his next run that he already filed for for the next four years. So what did they get out of the meeting? What did they get out of the meeting? I can tell you now, most of the HBCU presidents that met were very disappointed. They got a 15-minute meet and greet with President Trump. They got a photo op. And then they met with Vice President Pence. Very few of them got an opportunity to speak about their concerns and their needs for their own HBCUs. And when they were allowed to speak, they were given one to two minutes a time, you know, each to speak. So we've got to stop with the symbolism. We actually need real answers, real policies, and we need a government that's going to be committed to real answers and real policies for black America. As we close this section, the implication of monopolies. Okay. So again, these are the monopolies that we have looked at that are running our society, American society. We have looked at racial monopolies. We have looked at population monopolies, wealth monopolies. And today we've looked at media and political and judicial monopolies. So what is the implications? The advantages that flow to white society from various monopolies, the visible manifestations of racism, have yet to be weighted and analyzed to determine how they continue to handicap and injure black Americans in a competitive society. This is a competitive society. White monopolies guarantee white winners as if ordained by the gods. Few see their societal dominance as a persistent and fundamental injustice within American society. Racial monopolies adversely affect the welfare of blacks and further the best interests of the majority society. Within any marketplace, the majority society forces black competitors sometimes out of existence. The country's founders created a flawed social and political structure that only began to take on the appearance of social democracy, and that was only because of the Civil War and Reconstruction and blacks demanding some level of being treated humanely through the Civil Rights Movement. These national events were more symbolic rather than substantive. <clears throat> so... What is the bottom line here? Structural racism and its monopolies have boxed and locked in many blacks, but nothing created or constructed by mankind is perfect. And so even though many feel boxed and locked in, black America can compete and in some instances beat a monopoly. And so that's what Claude Anderson is talking about in this book. Yes, you may feel blocked and locked in, locked in but how can you beat this system? How can you beat this monopoly? And so he's talking about looking at three possible options that a group might use against tyrannies of majority monopolies. The oppressed group financially, economically can do these three things. Number one, they can revolt and engage in civil disobedience that brings about political and economic reform or an entirely new government. Number two, they can petition government to intervene on its behalf and force a white monopoly to divest itself of some wealth, resources, and power. Number three, they can construct alternative political and economic systems and monopolies based on its own group advantages within its own communities. So this book, as he says, is actually going to draw heavily 
on the second and the third option. And with, be, with as he says, with carefully planned behavioral changes, blacks can compete and in some instances beat these monopolies. So that's where we're going to stop for today. Next Friday, we're going to talk about the, um, the next impediment to actually winning. And that is inappropriate behavior patterns. Inappropriate behavior patterns. All right. Now, tools for titans. If you're an entrepreneur, I think you're going to enjoy some of these tips today. We're going to look at two entrepreneurs, Tony Robbins and uh, Casey Neistat. Tony Robbins, if you have heard of him, go ahead and put some hearts on the screen. Nobody's heard of Tony Robbins? All right. Tony Robbins is the world's most famous, as he coined himself, performance coach. The world's most famous performance coach. Um, I didn't hear about Tony Robbins until last year. I had a couple of friends who have been to his seminars and have... Um, been to the one seminar where he does where he has people walking over hot coals or something like that but he has advised everyone from bill clinton and serena williams to leonardo dicaprio and oprah tony robbins has consulted or invites or advised international leaders including nelson mandela mikhail gorbachev margaret thatcher princess diana mother Teresa, and three u.s presidents he has also developed and produced five award-winning television infomercials that have continuously aired, on average, every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day, somewhere in North America since 1989. So Tony Robbins knows a little bit about performance. A little bit, yeah. So here is something that he was asked. He was basically asked, what is one of his mantras in life? And he said, he learned this from Nelson Mandela when when he when he interviewed Nelson Mandela and he asked him how did you survive all those years in prison Nelson Mandela gave him this answer I didn't survive I prepared Now that is just a sermon all in of itself <laughs> I didn't survive I prepared and, I, and, and the moment I heard that, I went and I, I went back to what we just read, that for some reason in our country, we think it is okay to applaud black survival. I know that sounds strange. And that's wonderful. It's wonderful that you survived hell as a black person. But, <laughs> here's my but. Everything should not have to be about surviving black struggle. At some point, right, at some point, we should just want to celebrate because we have thrived, right? Not just because we survived, not just because we went through struggle after struggle after struggle after struggle. It's almost as if in our society, People think that struggle and black is supposed to be synonymous. And I just refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that. I don't know about anybody else, but I refuse to believe that. So Nelson Mandela says, I didn't survive. I prepared. What was he doing in prison all those years? He was preparing to come out. He was preparing to lead. He was preparing to have a plan. So... It's not just about being in a space, right? It's about what you do when you're in that space. We've been talking about Joseph. What was Joseph doing? Joseph from the Bible. What was Joseph doing when he was in those spaces? He was preparing. He was learning new skills. He was honing skills. So it's not just about surviving the event. It's the preparation that you do where you are. So I thought that was very good. Then he asked him the question, is there a quote that guides your life? He says this, life is always happening for us, not to us. 
I'll say that again. Life is always happening for us, not to us. It is our job to find out where the benefit is. And if we do, then life will be magnificent. Then he said, losers react, leaders anticipate. Losers react, leaders anticipate. What does that mean again? It goes back to preparing, preparing. Then he says, mastery doesn't come from an infographic. What you know doesn't mean a hill of beans. What do you do consistently? And I think I put up on my page yesterday, I was thinking about um, how much advice we take from people who are not qualified to advise us. <laughs> and I was thinking about, you know, God, what are the qualities that I look for in people to advise me in my life? And I thought about of the people that advise me, these are things that they um, hold as characteristics consistently. Number one, they're integrous. Number two, they're persistent in their own career and in their own fields. Number three, they're consistent. As he said, what do you consistently do? And number four, they are diligent. They don't quit. They don't stop when the going gets tough. Those are the kind of people that advise me. They, help, they have those characteristics. They're integrous. That means they're honest when nobody's looking. They don't cheat people in business. They're persistent. They keep going. They're consistent. Whatever they do, they're doing it all the time and they're not stopping and they're diligent. Then he talked about um, quality questions create a quality life. Quality questions create a quality life. And he was asked the question, what is the best investment he's ever made? And he said, the investment in myself the investment in my own education. And I'll read his words, quote, investing in yourself is the most important investment you'll ever make in your life. There's no financial investment that'll ever match it because if you develop more skill, more ability, and more insight and more capacity, that is what's going to provide economic freedom. It's your skill sets that make that happen. Jim Rohn famously said, if you let your learning lead to knowledge, you become a fool. But if you let your learning lead to action, you become wealthy. So that takes me back to the scripture where it says that many people are ever learning, right? But they never come to the knowledge of the truth. Truth is something that is active. So we don't want to be the people that are ever learning and never putting into action what we learn. He says, your questions determine your focus. The quality of your life, the quality of your life is the quality of your questions. The quality of your life is the quality of your questions. Questions will determine your focus. Sometimes we spend our lives focusing on negativity and therefore we have the wrong priority. Then he said he learned this from his first um, event about giving yourself a daily strategy, giving yourself a daily strategy for getting up, for moving, and for getting going in life. And he put these three words up and he had the word state, story, and strategy. State, story, and strategy. He believes that if you have a lowered emotional state, you will only see problems and not solutions. So the first thing you have to do when you get up in the morning, and some of us probably already do this, but he's just basically putting, uh, giving you the framework for how to talk about what you already do. So he said, you have to first change your emotional state. So say you wake up in the morning and you feel tired or you feel overwhelmed and you're trying to sit down and you're trying to get busy at your work. Maybe some of you um, work from home. And so when you get up in the morning, you're feeling sluggish. You're feeling tired. What do you do to overcome that? Because that inhibits you from actually brainstorming, making the calls you need to make, putting out the ads or the advertisements you need to make when you're working, especially from home. 
So he says, these things, when you're in a lowered emotional state, you only see your problems and not your solutions. So it begins to slow you down from being productive. He said to fix this, you have to prime your state first. In other words, you have to prime your emotional state. You have to prime your biochemistry to help you proactively enable yourself in whatever your story is or whatever your assignment is for the day. Only then do you think on strategy as you'll see options instead of dead ends. So I'll say that again because that was a lot. You have your state, so you have to prime your emotional state. Most Christians do that by prayer, by praise, by thinking on these things. Then he says, once you have your emotional state right and your biochemistry right, then you can deal with your story or you can deal with your assignment for the day. And when you're dealing with your assignment for the day, then you can produce strategies instead of dead ends. All right. So some of the things that he talked about as far as how you can prime your state. Some people do exercises, right? This is why some people get out at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning and they go and work out first because they're priming their body. They're priming their emotional state. They're getting their biochemistry right. Some people add to that breakfast, right? So sometimes people, he was saying that Many times people get stuck mentally or they get stuck in their day and they can't figure out what they need to do next because they need to fix those first two things. They need to fix their emotions, get their emotions in check, and they also need to work on their biochemistry. Sometimes maybe you have not eaten properly or maybe you have eaten too late in the day and you should have eaten earlier. So sometimes changing what you're doing and your physiology is going to help you with clarity of thought about your assignment and then working on your strategy for your assignment, which I completely agree with. Some of us are running on E as business owners and entrepreneurs, and we've got to get back to the place where we are setting ourselves up for success. Sometimes that means going to sleep earlier guilty <laughs> so that you can have more energy for your entire day and not feel like you're catching up right because you're you feel like your body at times has not gotten enough rest so some of the things that he does for morning priming is sometimes he says he will do a cold water plunge or use a quick shower and it could be 30 to 60 seconds to charge his body chemistry also, this is something I do that he does as well, is breathing exercises, doing three sets of breath, taking in your breath through your mouth, taking in your breath through your mouth, releasing through your nostrils. Those are breathing exercises that you can do. Um, sometimes people do breath walking where they're doing that and they're walking and they're being intentional about their steps. They're putting heel to toe, heel to toe, heel to toe. That's a way of charging your own body's chemistry to get you prepped and ready for your day. Okay. Then he says he does something that he calls um, nine to 10 minutes of meditation, nine to 10 minutes of meditation for believers, that could be nine to 10 minutes of prayer at the beginning of your day. And then he goes on to detail that and he says, the first three minutes, I simply spend those three minutes being grateful, being grateful, making sure that I am grateful for something very, very simple, like the wind on my face, the reflection of the clouds. I don't just think gratitude, but I allow gratitude to fill my soul. The second three minutes, I focus on feeling the presence of God. I focus on feeling the presence of God. I feel him healing everything in my body, my mind, my emotions, my relationships, my finances. 
I see him as solving anything that needs to be solved. The last three minutes, I focus on things that I, I'm going to make happen or my three to thrive. I see those things as though it's already been done. Now, clearly, he just gave you three biblical principles. Did he not? Okay. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's number one. Number two, feel, understand, and recognize that the presence of God is within you if you are a Christian. Right? We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Number three, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I'm going to think on the things that God has already told me that I'm going to do. And I'm going to begin to think on those things as if they are already done. So that's nine minutes. And as he said, he said, if you don't have nine to 10 minutes to stop and to think on these things, you don't have a life. <laughs> he said, if you don't have 20 minutes to dive into yourself and to think, that means you really need two hours. If you don't have 20 minutes, you probably need two hours. In other words, you need to take some time to do some internal soul work. And I know a lot of times people get up and they get going with their day and they have not stopped to pause. They have not stopped to thank God. They have not stopped to even acknowledge that God is with them in their day. And so if you're that person who gets up, throwing yourself out of bed, throwing in your clothes, getting dressed at the last minute, going out to try to be productive, if you're that person that's always in a rush, I would say set your alarm and add about 20 more minutes into your prep time so that you can make time to do this. Okay. So that was... Tony Robbins. He said he was asked the question, what is a commonality across the best investors? Because he also coaches um, and meets with people who invest in the stock market who've made millions of dollars on it. And he said one of the things that stuck out to him about all of the best investors that he works with is that all of them were real givers. Real givers, not just givers on the surface, but really passionate about giving. Let's let that sink in. All right, we're getting coming to a close here. Our next person is Casey Neistat. Casey Neistat was a, is a New York based filmmaker and YouTuber. He ran away from home at 15 and had his first child at 17. He went on welfare to get free milk and diapers and never asked his parents for money again. His online films have been viewed nearly 300 million times in the last five years. He is a writer, director, editor, and star of the series The Neistat Brothers on HBO. His main body of work consists of dozens of short films he has released exclusively on the internet including regular contributions to the New York Times Op Doc series. He is also the founder of Beam, a startup aiming to make creating and sharing videos dead simple. All right, so one of Casey's tips, and I actually uh, believe in this myself, he says, follow what angers you. Follow what angers you. Um, I always tell people that if you really want to know where your calling lies, look at what you get angry about. I know what I get angry about. That's why I'm doing something about it. <laughs> but follow what angers you. He made a short film about bike lanes in 2011, and it became his first viral hit. How did it start? He was given a summons by the New York City Police uh, by a New York City police officer for riding his bike outside of the bike lane. 
So he got so angry about it that he decided to create a short film riding around New York City, crashing into everything that was in the bike lanes that prevented people from actually following that rule. The film became uh, tremendously successful and went viral and was seen around 5 million times in its first day. At one point, he had gotten the mayor's attention and the mayor had to respond to a question about the video during a press conference. So he actually affected change by something that, af that affected him personally and he got so angered by it that he decided to create a film on it and that film got him national recognition and attention. So he said, when in doubt about your next creative thing, follow your anger. Then he says, um, what's the most outrageous thing you can do is to do something you've always wanted to do. Do something you've always wanted to do. And he says he takes this from Ben Franklin's quote, if you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. Write things worth reading or do things worth writing. Last question he was asked, who do you think of when you hear the word successful? Who do you think of when you hear the word successful? And his answer was my grandmother. She passed away at 92. She's my hero. She started tap dancing when she was six years old. She was a fat girl and her parents made her do something to lose weight. So she started tap dancing and she loved it. She fell in love with something at age six and didn't stop tap dancing until the day before she died at 92. She died on a Monday morning and the first thing we had to do was call her 100 tap students to say she wasn't going to make class that day. So what is the ultimate quantification of success? For me, it's not how much time you spend doing what you love. It's how little time you spend doing what you hate. And this woman spent all day, every day, doing what she loved. So I'm going to stop there. I think that was some great insight. And when you find yourself doing all day what you hate, it's time to change. Whether that is a career choice, whatever it is, if you find yourself doing what you hate all day, that's when you have to go into your prayer closet. That's when you have to go and seek the Lord and say, Lord, I am dissatisfied with the life that I'm living. It's nobody else's fault, so I'm coming to you. What is it that I can do about my situation? How can I move myself out of this situation? Am I supposed to be in this situation or do, am I supposed to learn a lesson here or do you want me to shift gears? Um, I know one, uh, job I was in, it had gotten so bad that literally it was wearing my body down. I mean, I enjoyed the subject matter, but the way in which I was being worked like a workhorse was literally breaking my body down. I actually had um, tendonitis in both of my wrists for about a year. And it took me a little, a little over a year to recover from it. And um, because of that, it, it stopped me from driving. I couldn't drive because I couldn't, I was in braces in both of my um, arms and I couldn't write. And I said, if I'm going to be doing anything that's going to take away from basic abilities and my ability to write, then this is, this is something that has to go because why? It was deteriorating my very health. It was deteriorating the very area of gifting that I'm called to. So that was a clear wake up sign for me that I needed to do something different from what I was doing at the time. So I'll read that quote one last time before we go. He said, what is the ultimate quantification of success? For me, it's not how much time you spend doing what you love. It's how little time you spend doing what you hate. I hope that you got something from today's Daring Dialogues. 
We'll be back on Monday with our Monday motivation with Detours with Tony Evans. Until then, you all have a great and wonderful weekend. If you catch us on the weekends, we are broadcasting uh, Sundays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we'll be continuing with our series on fathers and fatherhood. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me this week. Those of you who have been here, um, my super fans, Bespoke and Apostle um, Brooks, thank you all for tuning in today. And those of you who are watching by other uh, media apps, those of you who are watching through the computer, those of you who are watching outside of the app, those of you who are watching through Twitter, thank you again for joining us for Daring Dialogues. Take care and God bless.